changing gears a little bit, yesterday we presented things, uh, really amorphous solid dispersions, and really the end goal in these cases was to make a solid oral dosage form in the form of a tablet in many cases, either through hot melt extrusion or spray drying or other means. Today, speaking about multi-phase systems, really the end goal is it's a liquid-based system that can ultimately be encapsulated within something like a soft gel form, or in other cases, a liquid-type formulation, uh, either an oral liquid or whatnot, but really these are a, a very interesting and a very complex system, and there was also a very nice presentation yesterday on lipid-based drug delivery systems, so this is uh, a complement to that. <clears throat> so uh, uh, again, a very brief introduction into poorly water-soluble drugs and some of the techniques, uh, soft gels and why these are a good uh, vehicle for the delivery of these lipid-based systems. Uh, the complexity of lipids inherent to the system and why this can be a real challenge to uh, drug delivery and also from a formulation standpoint. Uh, the need for surfactants in these types of systems and how we can make decisions based on these. Uh, and finally, some complex formulations discovered through high throughput experimentation. Uh, here in Ludwigshafen, I, I do not have an army of graduate students to do uh, a lot of the wet chemistry type work. So we've uh, been in imploring a number of different interesting technologies uh, through robotic means to start looking at how we can figure out good formulations very quickly. Uh, in particular, one of the comments that I heard yesterday during the lipid talk was about, you know, a favorite SEDS and SMEDS formulation. Uh, and this is typically what happens within the industry, regardless of whether you're making tablets or topicals or lipid-based systems. There's a tendency to fall back on what we know works already. So I see our job as uh, an excipient supplier is to find formulations that we know, that we can trust, that we can put ultimately into your toolbox to be used for these types of systems. So we're using a number of different really interesting techniques within our laboratory to come up with ways to uh, improve and expand the toolbox of available formulations that you have. So. Here's, I think, the sixth time you've seen this slide uh, over the past two days, but again, we're looking at this from a slightly different angle. Again, you have your, your brick-based molecules, highly crystalline, high melting point, high log P, and then you have your grease ball formulations. Uh, depending, again, on the affinity of the surfactants, the polymers, the lipids in your system can change, ultimately, the dosage form that you're looking for. And I don't think I need to talk much about the BCS class system. <laughs> Uh, however, and as I mentioned when I first started, really there's, there's a split here in terms of the technologies that I think ultimately are very elegant and very simple formulations that can lead to producing either a, a, a capsule type formulation or a solid oral dosage formulation. So we talked yesterday again about these hot melt extrusion, spray drying, and now today talking more on the lipid-based drug delivery systems. Now these can be complex for a completely different reason. Now you have a emulsion-based systems in many cases where you have a distinct oil phase, you have a distinct water phase. Sometimes the phases are not particularly distinct, which I will go into. These lipid phases can also be solid in many cases. So these are called solid lipid dispersion, solid lipid nanoparticles, these types of systems. Uh, and also they tend to be colloidal in nature. So there's a very important interplay of the polymers and surfactants that are used in these systems, which allow for adequate solubilization of the drug. The other challenge, which we'll hear in the subsequent talks, is when you have these very challenging systems, how do you measure them, and how do you know how much drug is actually coming out? So soft gel capsules are really a perfect vehicle for the oral delivery of lipid-based systems. So we have three distinct parts here. The first being the shell. The shells tend to be gelatin-based. Uh, there have been a number of innovations in this side, making them uh, out of more vegetable-based products, out of more polymer-based products. You can modify the release of them through some innovative technologies. But one thing is sure, uh, gelatin is cheap, it is available, and uh, companies that focus on encapsulation have a tremendous amount of knowledge in working with gelatin. So because of all of that, most systems still end up in gelatin-based soft gels. Um, however, what is really crucial here is that the excipients used must be fully compatible. So I'll give you a very short example. If you were to use something like a polyethylene glycol, if you use a traditional polyethylene glycol that has not been protected by any means, 
uh, over time, aldehyde levels tend to grow in the presence of oxygen, and this leads to the cross-linking of the gelatin shell. When this happens, the drug does not release uh, when it's supposed to. It tends to get more delayed, or it doesn't come out whatsoever. So this is a real problem in a system that could only have a single uh, peg and a single API. So this is something that um, we look at as well in terms of excipient compatibility when trying to make these types of systems. We have the coding, so this allows for the modified release of the formulation. So soft gels are very unique from a coding standpoint because it's not a hard tablet. It, it can be relatively straightforward, and there are 20, 30, 40 years of experience of coatings onto uh, different solid-based systems. But this is now a flexible system. It's a dynamic system. It's a system where you now have moisture that can uh, enter during stabilization time, during, uh, while it's in stability at higher temperatures. You now have a plasticity that occurs there. At higher temperatures, the, the gelatin tends to be more flexible. Um, so your coating can't be particularly rigid because it will crack, it will break, and then ultimately you don't get any benefit from the modification of the release. Uh, so the best example of this is enteric release formulation. So uh, many of you have probably taken something like a fish oil type tablet. And you've probably taken some of the older versions where uh, maybe 45 minutes after taking one, you can almost taste the fish. They call it a fish burp, so to speak. Um, and now most of these are available on the market with an enteric coating on the, the outside, something like Colicote MAE, which we manufacture, that allows for release into the GI tract. So when we're thinking about these lipid-based systems and how to deliver the drugs adequately, when the target is really the GI tract, it's very straightforward in a soft gel type system to get into uh, the GI tract through just a simple coating mean. Next, we talk about the fill, and from a weight-by-weight weight percentage, the fill of a soft gelatin capsule tends to be about 60, 65, maybe 70% by weight. So we have a lot of um, room to add excipients, to add solubilizers, to add lipids, to add capacity for, for our drug. Um, so the formulation can be very simple, as I mentioned before, something like a peg-based system with a drug dissolved in it, and then to something even more complex like a SEDS formulation, a SNEDS, a SMEDS, all of these types of multi-phase systems that have one phase when they're encapsulated and then quite a different phase once they're dispersed inside the, drug, uh, inside the, the GI tract. So again, this is just uh, an example of the complexity. So we start with a simple API, uh, the shell, oftentimes there are lubricants during uh, uh, production that are added. We move to the next level of complexity. Now we're using different solvents to increase the API load. So these can be either hydrophilic or hydrophobic. We then move to further complexity. So now you're adding emulsifiers, co-emulsifiers, different lipid phases. Uh, a lot of interplay now takes place between the excipients and the API themselves. And again, keep in mind, these are not stable systems inherently because of the amount of environmental changes. In a soft gel in particular, they're somewhat oxygen permeable. They're certainly moisture permeable. Once you encapsulate something, it has a certain level of moisture. Then it is dried. This level of moisture is removed. Then more moisture comes in through the environment. And this makes it for a very tricky system to keep stable over time. And then finally, we add the functionalization on the outside. So you have this very advanced fill type system. And then you try and target it through uh, different uh, enteric, for example, means so understanding lipid complexity is something that's absolutely critical. And I think I touched on this a little bit yesterday, but as a, an excipient provider, it's something that really our core expertise is in. We manufacture a lot of these products. But lipids in particular are very complicated. Most of these are naturally derived. A lot of these lipids are based on palm oil, uh, palm kernel oil, coconut oil, rapeseed oil, and they add a tremendous amount of complexity and natural variability to the product. So if we just look at one very simple example, Colisol's MCT70s, there's a simple medium chain triglyceride that can be really a benchmark for a formulation for a SEDS and SMEDS formulation. But we look at this triglyceride molecule here, you have your, your uh, three fatty acids esterified to your glycerin molecule, you have the two alpha positions and the beta position, but within the monograph itself, 
itself, uh, either the USP or the Farm Oyer monograph, you now have all of these different allowances for variability. So we have 20 to 50 percent capric acid, less than 3 percent lauric acid, less than 1 percent myristic acid, less than 2 percent caproic acid, and 50 to 80 percent caprylic acid. Ultimately, it always adds up to 100 percent. But now we're also only talking about saturated uh, fatty acids here. There are also allowances for unsaturated fatty acids. When you add up this level of complexity, it is no wonder why uh, from batch to batch there is variability with naturally derived products, but also there's variability between suppliers, and this can lead to a lot of complication once you're looking at models later like lipolysis to see how the drug is actually being released. I want to very briefly touch on surfactant systems and how we categorize these. Uh, uh, this has been mentioned a little bit in a couple of different talks, so let's take a quick look at the HLB system. So here's a molecule, a, a standard surfactant, sodium lauryl sulfate. Arguably a poor example because it's ionized, but here we have the, the lipid chain, which is the hydrophobic portion, highlighted in the orange, and then we have the hydrophilic portion, which is highlighted in the blue. So in the lipid side, you now have, uh, so the HLB system is really a rule of thumb for uh, non-ionic surfactants. And this basically gives you a gauge of how uh, hydrophilic or hydrophobic the surfactant you have happens to be. So one core example of a, a good co-emulsifier, a lipidic uh, uh, emulsifier would be glycerol monooleate. Now, if you look at the hydrophilic side, you see a number of uh, very frequently used solubilizers like Cali4EL, Cali4TPGS, the polysorbates, the uh, Cali4RH40, HS15, and all the way at the other end of the spectrum in the 20 range, you see a lot of the poloxamer molecules that we were talking about yesterday function as enhanced solubilizers and plasticizers in solid oral systems. Uh, this is just a quick equation for how HLB is calculated, but I do want to caution everybody here that this is a system that was developed in 1949, and yet we still use it. Every single day, uh, there are questions that come in that are regarding what is the HLB of a given surfactant, but now we have these very complicated systems. These molecules self-assemble themselves. They now interact with oil portions of molecules. They interact with the aqueous and polymeric phases of our molecules, and the single number, which happens to be the benchmark standard, is, I would say, far too simple to be able to make adequate formulation type decisions. So I just want to keep that in mind when we're talking about surfactants throughout this talk and, and other talks, is that it gets a bit more advanced than, than a single number. Looking at the lipid formulation classification system, again, we have these, these uh, essentially four different types, and you start with medium and long chain triglycerides, simple systems that ultimately get uh, um, uh, 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 lipolysized inside the gut and, and the drug gets released. You move into more complex systems such as type 2 and type 3, 3A and 3B, and now you're adding things like a lipidic surfactant. So in type 2, you're adding something like a glycerol monooleate, fully miscible within a medium chain triglyceride system, but now once that drug gets released, you're emulsifying some of those droplets, so you don't just have these very large millimeter scale droplets that are being released, they now are on the, the micro type scale. Next, you add a bit more complexity, you add more hydrophilicity to the system, you add uh, hydrophilic surfactants uh, such as uh, Cali 4 RH40. So now you're pairing surfactants, you're blending things, and going back to what I mentioned about HLB before, it, it, we don't design excipients and we don't design emulsifiers at a specific HLB, for example, but there's an intricate pairing that you can have. You can take a higher hydrophilic type surfactant and pair it with a lower uh, HLB number to be able to get to the desired range. Uh, arguably, this is the way that you would uh, pair this with a specific oil, but ultimately it gets very difficult once you start adding other aspects to the system. And then finally, there's the, more, the, most hydrophobic, uh, the most hydrophilic portion of the system, where in this case you're now adding just hydrophilic excipients and co-solvents to help dissolve the API and keep it in solution. I want to talk very quickly about emulsion definitions. Um, so these get thrown around quite a bit in the, the academic literature as well as in the industrial literature, and there's a number of misnomers. So for the sake of this discussion, I wanted to define a few things. 
Uh, so we can start with a simple oil and water emulsion. So you have oil droplets that are surrounded now by a surfactant. The hydrophobic portion of that is, is essentially interacting with the oil portion, and the hydrophilic portion is now interacting with the aqueous environment. Best example of this, let's say milk, right? Milk, cream that we put in our coffee. This is a dispersion of oil lipid droplets that are in water. Uh, at the bottom here, we now have a water in oil emulsion. It's basically the opposite. Now you have a, a oil continuous phase where you have water now encapsulated within the, the, um, uh, the, the oil phase. The easiest way to tell whether it's oil continuous or water continuous is simply conductivity. A water in oil system, I'm sorry, an oil and water system will have a very high conductivity because it's water continuous, and then the opposite is true for the oil uh, continuous system. Again, the opposite is true for the surfactants that tend to be used, and, and this is why you tend to use uh, surfactants with a much lower HLB system to stabilize these systems. They're stabilized through uh, typically three specific ways. Uh, one would be steric stabilization. Your surfactant is physically getting in the way of your oil droplets aggregating. There's an ionic component to it, particularly if you use things like SLS that have an ionic charge. So these electrostatic forces can repulse the oil droplets or particles uh, of a system that prevent the, the aggregation, agglomeration, flocculation of these types of systems. Um, and also there's a kinetic stability. So in some cases you would make a nice emulsion like this and then just freeze it in place through high viscosity means using polymers or other type means. And this prevents things from wiggling and ultimately can uh, improve the stability of the system. Now talking about a true microemulsion. Um, so it, it's a bit funny how the terminology goes, but if you have an oil and water emulsion, let's say macroscopic, so these are millimeter sized droplets, and then you move to a system where they are now micro scale or nano scale, these are typically not called or shouldn't be called micro emulsions because in this case, a true definition of a micro emulsion is a bicontinuous system. It's a clever interplay of having oil, the very, uh, uh, typically a very high concentration of surfactant and water that's blended in a way that the oil phase and the water phase are now uh, essentially cr being created and collapsing upon one another at the same time. So the droplet sizes becomes almost meaningless at this, this time because you're talking about only a couple of nanometers. It also becomes almost impossible to measure. But there are some very uh, beautiful images that have been produced using things like cryo-TEM that show what a microemulsion looks like in this phase. But what's very interesting is now you have enough surfactant in this system to fully stabilize the system and essentially it's thermodynamically stable. So no matter how small you make these oil droplets, they're still, again, fighting that thermodynamic urge to aggregate, to grow into larger droplets over time. But when you get to a system like this, it stays like that. Um, now, once you take something like this, a bicontinuous microemulsion, you encapsulate it within a soft gelatin capsule, uh, you then can deliver it through self-emulsifying systems, self-microemulsifying systems, which is typically defined by how large the uh, oil droplets are afterwards. And yesterday we talked about self-nanoemulsifying systems where the droplets are quite small indeed. But uh, from a formulator standpoint, getting to something like this, where you have an inherently stable system that you can encapsulate and turn into a drug form that will very easily uh, form into these very nice um, uh, systems is ultimately where we want to go. Again, looking at the microemulsion, this is a very famous fish bone diagram, uh, or fish diagram. So here we have different uh, emulsion type systems. So if uh, I were to come to you as a formulator and say, okay, we want to make a true microemulsion, let's start mixing things together. You tend to get a number of these different phases. So when we look at this diagram here, this is typically your surfactant volume, and on your y-axis here, it's, it's temperature. These things are temperature dependent as a function of just energy input, but also it can be a blend of the surfactants, the, the primary emulsifier and co-emulsifier that I mentioned earlier. So in a Windsor type 1 emulsion, you now have water and surfactant that are perfectly happy with one another, but you're kicking out some oil phase. In the other side, the Windsor type 2, you're now kicking out the water phase and your, water, your oil and surfactant are quite happy. In the type 3, you actually get a, a, a metastable phase where you have a bit of microemulsion in the middle, but you're kicking out both oil and water phases that are not truly satisfied in this type of system from a thermodyna thermodynamic sense. A Windsor type 4, which is this 
uh, fishtail here, this is what we're trying to form. So you can see clearly there's a very strong dependence on how much surfactant is there. It's a lot of surface, uh, uh, surfaces to cover when you're talking about droplets that are essentially two nanometers in size. So there's a clear interaction on surfactant volume. And then the blend has to be very nice as well. They're quite interesting if you formulate them from a temperature standpoint, because you can make one that's nice, clear, uh, it's essentially a Newtonian liquid. You can hold it in your hand and walk to the next lab, and you'll start to see it separate. So there is a strong temperature dependence as well. So you want to design them to be a bit robust. So how do we get to these types of formulations? Again, we tend to use what's on the shelf already. Uh, so it, it's really my goal to put things on the shelf so that they can be ready to use. Uh, doing this with, uh, with graduate students and technicians can take a tremendous amount of time, and there's a lot of variability that can go into these types of formulations. So here at BSF, we started using uh, high-throughput robotic-type chemistry to build phase diagrams that can be adequately used by our customers. In this case, we're looking at something that was designed here by BSF in Ludwigshafen. This is a robotic system. It has a number of really interesting additions to it. So the central unit has this robotic arm. It can cap, it can barcode, it can look at different samples to make sure that nothing gets uh, uh, mixed up. From a dispensing standpoint, we can look at things like lipids, melts, uh, powders, liquids. Homogenization, we can do a number of different means to homogenize things. It could be a simple shaking which from a human standpoint can be very variable, but using a robot to do this to mix for maybe one minute is, is actually quite good because it's consistent. You can do uh, more high shear means like, uh, like an ultra Turex, for example, homogenizer, and then ultimately you can also do milling. From an analytical standpoint, we can look at things like particle size distribution, viscosity, image analysis, which when looking at microemulsions can be incredibly powerful because you can just look at it very quickly and see if you um, are forming one of those microemulsions that's not fully stable. Again, some of the analytical tools here, looking at homogeneity, looking at particle size, viscosity, and then ultimately there's a robot that can also look at solubilization screening. You can add things like an API and see whether this is being dissolved as well. This is uh, definitely a bit of an eye chart, but I want to spend a little bit of time explaining what the results work, uh, look like. So it's, it's great to have a robot do a lot of your experimentation for you, but then you have to actually look at it and understand what it means. So here we have uh, each individual column. We're looking at a primary emulsifier. So here, here's your poloxamers, here's your polysorbates, here's TPGS, HS15, and our core primary emulsifiers we looked at, uh, RH40, Cali4 RH40, and Cali4 EL. In each sub-column, you're now looking at the pairing of uh, a co-surfactant. So here's glycerol monooleate. Here's just using a peg-based system. Here's a combination of glycerol monooleate and polyethylene glycol. Here's when you add ethanol to the system. And here's when you add uh, something like a poloxamer to the system. So this is a liquid poloxamer, a bit more hydrophobic, P124. The way that we define the different uh, phase ratios, so we have the volume ratio, so how much oil is in the system overall. So when you look at this graph, we're looking at uh, uh, percentages that are, are fairly high, 20, 30, 40, 50% by weight. Surfactant mixture, so how much co-surfactant in ratio to the whole amount of surfactant that happens to be there. And in these cases, this can be very important and has an influence on that uh, HLV value we talked about before. And then finally, the total amount of surfactant. It's a lot of surface area here. There's a, a lot of surfactant that needs to be used to make these systems. The robot defines this through a number of ways. So two-phase system, and this is simply just using visual analysis to look for microemulsions. All of these little blue squares here are essentially failures. These are two-phase systems that had segregated over the course of 24 hours. A single one-phase clear or slightly turbid but low viscosity system, so these are our, our core microemulsions that we're looking for. These are these green uh, 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 squares here. A, a single-phase system with a high viscosity, this is when you have the orange dots here, and then a one-phase system with a, a high viscosity but is opaque and not necessarily desirable is in these, uh, these tan-type colors. This is... Um, our first iteration using the robot. So um, the results here were 
Um, not the most robust that we were looking for, but it did tell us some very important things. So first and foremost, that RH40 and EL, you can see all of the colors of the rainbow here, are quite important for formulating these types of things. The addition of ethanol as a co-solvent, we saw that in the talk yesterday, can be very powerful in improving the, uh, the stability and the formation of microemulsions. And that glycerol monooleate is a versatile co-emulsifier for making these types of formulations. Next, we went into a second iteration. We said, okay, we can focus on one of these primary emulsifiers like uh, Cali 4 RH40, but can we make uh, some nice phase diagrams that really can map out where we have adequate use? So we designed this, and again, this is basically how the robot is programmed. You have the dosing of ingredients. It can do this very precisely, even with these challenging surfactants like RH40 that are essentially a semi-solid at room temperature. Uh, these are buffered systems. They're measuring the glycerol monooleate and also the medium chain triglycerides. There's a homogenization stage for a single minute, so it's just shaking the, uh, the, the tube in a very precise way. If this is clear and homogeneous, we consider this a pass. There's also the ultra-turax homogenizer to see if maybe the addition of shear can push this into a, a favorable state. And uh, uh, formulations that had separated go into this inhomogeneous and failed thing. So, Looking at about 180 experiments, this uh, total run took about three days, which is quite fantastic when you look at it from a, a resource point of view. So these are the blocks that we were looking at, different blends, so entirely Cali 4 RH40. Uh, these are the blended HLB values, so 15, 13.3, 12.2, 11.1, and about 10. So ranging from 100% RH40 to 55% RH40 counterbalanced with the glycerol monooleate. The important thing to note here is if you were to go to Google and say, what surfactant should I use for medium chain triglycerides in an emulsion-based system, they would tell you about 10. So we'll see if that actually works. And these are some of the plots that, that come out um, in terms of the design phase. So the first phase diagram we'll take a look at, again, this is block one, so only Cali 4 RH40, no glycerol monooleate. All of these red dots here, and uh, this is a, a tertiary phase diagram, so you're looking at this is your medium chain triglyceride concentration, starting with zero and moving to 100. Water is on this axis here, so increasing water concentrations and increasing surfactant concentrations here. So we were seeing some homogeneous solutions after shear, but this really wasn't the true microemulsion system that we were looking for. However, when we move to block two, we now see this tremendous region here, which is uh, basically what we were looking for. So again, looking at this axis, we're looking at a line that has 10% water in it, the balance oil, and between 40 and 80% surfactant. Now that might sound like a lot, but when you're looking at an, a lipid-based system in a soft gelatin capsule, this is perfectly acceptable in many cases. So again, this region here was what we were looking at. Uh, it's Difficult to see with these pictures. We actually put a book, the solubility book, uh, behind it. So that's why you see some of the light bending. But these are perfectly clear. They essentially look like water, maybe a little bit thicker than that, so like a peg-based system. But keep in mind, these have 60% surfactant in them, and they're free-flowing. If you were to put this into a real system like a soft gelatin capsule, there's a viscosity limitation on how you're going to be able to put this into a capsule. So this is something that's very important to be able to get there. And again, I want you to notice that uh, we're at an HLB of about 13.3, so quite a bit higher than we would have expected. Uh, block three, we start to lose some of that phase that we want, and really only at the higher and, and lower ranges of the surfactant, we got these true microemulsions. And again, here are the images uh, listed here. When we further go down in terms of HLB value, we now have only a single point uh, and a reduced area of homogeneous formulation. So this was not particularly successful. And then finally, we look at the last one, which again would be the, if you were to Google it, the gold standard, let's do everything at an HLB of 10, we found that it really didn't work particularly well. And we only had, again, this single point up at the top of the phase diagram. So really, from a formulation standpoint, we want to go back to block two and say, look, this region here, we can look at different surfactants. And ultimately, what we want to do with this data is take these, these um, load them up with API, and put them into various different uh, uh, bio-relevant media to see how they behave now that you have this high level of surfactant. What do the droplets look like? How do they behave, and how do they influence drug dissolution? 
So summary and rule of thumb, the formulation of lipid-based systems is highly dependent on the excipients and the excipient use. Again, we're now talking about lipid systems. They're inherently natural, and they are complex as a consequence of that. So this amount of variability needs to be uh, thought of from a formulation standpoint. Uh, high throughput experimentation allows for quicker and more precise determination of phase diagrams, and I'll show a little bit more of that uh, later today. Um, and basically what we're doing with this, this data is essentially hot off the presses. So we're doing subsequent runs over the coming months to, to create other phase diagrams with the goal of just saying, here, here's some phase diagrams to take a look at. When you're looking for a new microemulsion type formulation, this is the region that you need to be. And these are the typical surfactants that need to be used to form these stably. Um, and then utilizing uh, uh, poorly water-soluble compounds and evaluating with biorelevant media. BASF. We create chemistry.